so yeah my name is lucy hayho i am a live artist uh, and i make participatory projects both kind of in uh usual sort of cultural spaces galleries and theaters but also very often outside or site-specific work um and my practice is hopefully socially engaged and most of the time what I'm trying to do with my work is kind of reimagine or reinterpret quite um quite familiar lived environments um so I thought I'd kind of talk to you today about a few of my projects but through the lens of thinking primarily about the kind of the spatial context of the work and how that those kind of pre-existing narratives of spaces play into the work that you're putting into them and the potential to kind of harness the stories that people that participants bring to the work itself by kind of playing with their expectations of how they behave in certain spaces um and so the first sort of frame i'm looking at is frames um and I think so when like part when you make kind of outdoor work um what you can potentially lose is the sort of the framing contact context that this is like an art experience um that would be more present in you know an expected space like a gallery etc but I think the opportunity that you get here is that you get to sort of frame the experience however you like for participants um and also like that the work itself can become the frame for a space a particular space um and so this is something that's kind of in play in a project i do called new national parks um new national parks uh seeks to kind of reframe and reclaim spaces that are often kind of ignored or marginalized. And then we sort of have these kind of series of playful interventions that kind of reposition these places as cultural, culturally significant or traditional heritage sites. Um, so we use that with the kind of aesthetic language and physical interventions you might expect to find in like in a national park in America or like in a national trust. Um, in the UK. So this particular project was um, in Chemnitz in Germany, which is a town um, that would have been in, in the east of Germany. Um, and <laughs> we took over a wasteland space, which was kind of in between uh, a, a, a tram line. Oh, have I stopped? Ooh, oh, oh, I've skipped a bit forward the yeah the space of so the space kind of sat between a tram line and a block of houses um the houses were bombed during the second world war and then the site had just kind of been left to seed uh and so the kind of the patisserie patery approach for this space was um a four-week residency where we researched the site and that involved kind of speaking in very limited German to local residents about the space, finding the people that used to live in the houses that had since been taken down um, and spending a lot of time in the kind of local library. Um, the result of that kind of period of research and talking to all the people involved in that space was that we opened it as a as a national park for five days. Um, so it was open, there were walking trails, there were guided tours of the site, you could have a picnic in the middle of the site. And it kind of um, really changed the way that people who were who'd been familiar with walking past that site every day. Now it became this kind of weird sort of semi tourist destination for five days. And then thinking about how that project was then moved to a larger site. So then another commission we had was to kind of take the whole of Coventry as a potential new national park, a place that needed a sort of um, a rebrand. Um, and so obviously 
a Covent, the whole of Coventry is quite a lot bigger than a, a section of wasteland um, and with a very limited budget. Um, so what we decided to do here was we created a natural history walking tour of Coventry city centre, kind of playing with the expectations um, that Coventry has kind of got this reputation of, I guess, unnaturalness. Uh, it's very concrete, you know, the kind of 60s new town vibes. Um, but what we did with our walking tour, um, we took people to points of interest, which included the kind of the very top of a multi-story car park. And then we walked and we visited a, a reptile shop, um, which sold kind of reptiles and lizards for pets. We also went round to the back of a KFC uh, which is the only place inside the city centre where you can still access the river because the rest of it's been kind of completely covered in concrete. Um, and I guess what we were doing by having this sort of walking tour, sorry, my thing's got a bit sticky. And it keeps flipping. So yeah, so for the walking tour, um, because the participants were local people, we kind of didn't want them to just kind of stroll around with us looking at these things. So we asked everyone to walk in silence and to walk a meter distance from each other. And that kind of changed the kind of behavioral expectations that they had of their very familiar kind of town center. And it helped us to, to kind of disrupt um, their experience of that space and kind of draw and look at it with a sort of new intention. Um, and so thinking of kind of new intentions, um, I think uh, participatory outdoor practice, as well as sort of framing and drawing attention to certain spaces, we can really use the kind of the modes that we work in to challenge and disrupt normal kind of spatial norms. Um, so I'm going to look at this in regards to borders and a project that I do called Mobile Border Unit. Uh, and so Mobile Border Unit creates a kind of absurd roaming international border crossing at unexpected sites. Um, and it's very simply kind of constructed. So uh, we have a passport check-in desk, barriers and a team of kind of border guards in our kind of uniform and the border guards kind of check and stamp the passport of everybody that passes through the space. Uh, and so it was performed at a festival in Freiburg in Switzerland and the border was set up outside the bar, uh, outside the theater. We popped it at the bottom of the stairs in a gallery space. Um, we we're outside the toilets. At one point we kind of went spanned across a whole sort of car park and the work is kind of quite light touch and quite irreverent so participants were sort of chatted to and joked with and there was never any question that anyone couldn't cross the border but they all had to go through the process of doing it um, and we reversed some of the kind of expectations of the border experience um, so we would draw people aside, but instead of kind of interrogating them, we would tell them kind of a secret about ourselves. And every day we celebrated the hundredth border crosser and kind of showered them in confetti and gave them kind of this small gift. Um, so what, so although it was kind of light and playful, it, it was also a slight nuisance. And I guess the aim of the project was to sort of draw attention more to the kind of the arbitrary way in which we kind of draw these lines inland and so much of how our lives pan out is is due to whether we're seen to be com coming from here or there um and so although the experience itself was quite light and fun in places it kind of provoked these kind of more, um, I guess, deeper conversations about, about these lines that we draw in the sand. Um, and there's us celebrating one of our hundredth border crosses of the day. Um, she's delighted, as you can see. Um, and then the last kind of frame I'm gonna talk about is the potential of work to kind of create new spaces outdoors, and particularly in kind of 
urban environments and the possibility of being able to create a new space that can prioritize certain minority groups. Um, and kind of me coming from my perspective that happened in terms of kind of creating sort of queer spaces. And so a project I did very recently is called one in one out lead smallest gay bar. Um, and it is essentially a miniature gay bar. It's exactly what it says on the tin. So it is um, no bigger than a telephone booth and one person at a time can visit the gay bar and they go inside, there's a cloakroom, there's a bar, and then they're kind of left to uh, enjoy a shot of, shot of a shot, a shot of Jerry Sowers. Um, and they're just kind of left to dance and experience the space for however long they choose. And I guess, you know, it's kind of a, an obvious metaphor, but the small scale of the booth reflects the kind of the shrinking um, queer spaces in the UK and particularly in London. And um, just having a little sticky moment on the old slides again. Yeah, so I think, you know, so the intention for me making this was, you know, the the experience of being prioritized in a space and kind of celebrating the sort of naffness, but also the kind of the greatness of these spaces. But I think from doing the work in Leeds a couple of weeks ago, what was really interesting was what happened kind of outside the bar and this kind of temporary queer space that it created in the street. So all of a sudden, like <laughs> these participants started doing these kind of mad flamboyant exits out of the bar space, completely <laughs> sort of unprovoked. Um, and people waiting to go into the experience, um, kind of hanging around. And it felt a bit like, like you'd queue for an actual club or a bit like a smoking area at a club. And it was really nice. And then we had these kind of weird moments where we'd all be singing in the street and dancing to kind of Robin, um, which was also kind of really lovely and really ex unexpected. And I just wanted to show you quickly the kind of setting for the work. Um, yeah, and so that we we created this kind of temporary queer space in this very quiet, quiet side street um, alleyway of Leeds Civic Trust, uh, which has got a weird kind of juxtaposition going on. Um, so I kind of like the way that the work draws attention to the, the space that it's already in, um, but also kind of pr provokes people to kind of participate in a reimagining of, of the space. And I think there is a kind of a potential in participatory practices, particularly for re narratizing spaces or disrupting dominant narratives. And for me, what helps me kind of realize the potential with, with participants is kind of using expected sort of behavioral codes of certain spaces and then sort of kind of tweaking and twisting them in a way that allows for kind of a play to happen between the work and the space and participants. And then, um, yeah, I just thought I'd end on this little um, quote um, from Dory Massey, who if you don't know, you should check her out because she is a kick-ass human geographer. And um, she describes spaces as a multiplicity of stories in a constant state of becoming. And I guess what I really love about this view is the way that, that she recognizes the existing kind of narratives of spacing spaces, but she kind of hints at a potential for change, for the possibility of change. And I think in terms of um, outdoor experiential or interactive work, it's really important to consider the spaces and the stories that you're kind of bringing your work into and also how that kind of interplays with the stories um, that participants bring to the space with them and the potential um, for kind of playing together to create sort of new kind of narratives and that is it that's me so thanks for listening and looking forward to chatting with you now and hearing more about what you've been up to over the last few days.
I'm going to stop the screen share. You can see my face. Thanks. <laughs> That was really brilliant. Thank you, Lucy. We're going to open up some space to ask questions, have some conversations. And does anyone want to kick us off? We talked about geography. Um, I just wondered, can you hear me? Yeah, just about. <laughs> okay. You talked about geography. Um, I just wondered, in terms of your background, is it science and art coming together? Like, have you got that geography background or? Was it just a kind of pretty straight path to where you're at? I'm just wondering where you came from, from what you studied at school and yeah. maybe uni or how you got where you were. Sure. Um, so I did not study geography, um, <laughs> but uh, no, I actually, I studied drama at university quite a long time ago now. I studied at Goldsmiths, but in my final year there, I did a live art course. And I think that was like really the moment for me because I'd always been like quite into fine art at school and I kind of saw like drama and art as two very separate things. And I think this live art course was the time when I was like, huh, there's this kind of middle ground where you can make things, but also be performative. Um, so that's where I guess the kind of performative aspect of my work comes from and then the geography aspect um i studied a master's uh, a couple of years ago um called narrative environments and it's about it kind of kind of comes from exhibition design but it's about how we can use space to tell stories and tell things in a spatial way so that can include like you know very traditional kind of museum and exhibition design it can be, you know, art installation, but then they also talk about, you know, very kind of commercialized settings for kind of, you know, big expos by Nike and stuff like that. So I guess that's, but that's where I kind of got to know about human geographers and kind of my interest, I guess, more in kind of the spatial emerged. Yes, that's the plan. Um, so the I made a very, very rubbish version of it a couple of years ago for about £3.50 with some borrowed materials slash stolen from Guildhall School of Music and Drama. Um, and then I applied to an open call with a festival in Leeds called Compass and they commissioned it and we developed it with some money from another small organization to kind of build the booth as it is now. So yes, that booth is available for touring. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, I have a couple of, of irons in the fire. So hopefully it will be going to Bristol and Liverpool um, this year at some point. COVID restrictions permitting. Although happily I haven't I haven't by accident made a socially distant show. So that's quite handy. I don't think putting my ear to the screen makes any difference, but I'm doing it anyway. just told them to. <laughs> um, no, so we'd actually, so we did the walk a couple of times and the first time we did it. So, uh, okay, a bit of framing context. Um, I do that work 
with a collaborator. So there's two of us. And when we do it, we are dressed as park rangers. So I guess there is, there is, there is some kind of authority there. So we have our kind of branded green t-shirt hat uniform on. Um, and we, I guess we're not playing a part, but there's a sense that this is like an official walk and they're given a guide and they were told how long it would be. And it was all, you know, there's a sense of, I guess, officiality about that, which helps. But the first time we did the walk, we just kind of said, oh yeah, we'll go for, we um, just let people chat in between. And we just realized this just really wasn't working because these are people who are already, you know, this is their city. It's not our city. And so they're just walking around going, oh, why are these girls taking us up to the top of the car park? So, so we decided to, we needed to change it. And yeah, we just, we just explained that that's how would we would be walking between each point of interest and said that when we get to the point of interest, you know, we'll have a chat and we did chat with people, but we said it is really important that we pass through the city in this format. And I guess we didn't have a massive, we didn't have massive groups. So I think the biggest group was about nine people with two of us at each end. So that's easy to kind of manage that format. Um, but it also was quite fun because, you know, we did stupid things like make them walk around in circle for a while and see it and just, just kind of play about with it. But yeah, I think, I think having a uniform, telling people what to do, you know, maybe if the high, if you have to wear a high vis to make it happen, <laughs> so be it. dynamic and I've never really considered it before. I'm not sure that it's going to manage to percolate into something in the next couple of weeks, but I <laughs> hold on to that thought. <laughs> Good. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Esther, I can see something like percolating. <laughs> Um, a lot of what we've been doing this morning is we've been talking about um, how we work socially with audiences and with participants and the relationships that we have with, with, our, with the people that we're working with and how we, how we engage with them. I suppose listening to you talk, I'm wondering about how you perceive of the people that come along to your events and how much, because listening to you, I'm thinking there's actually quite a lot of social control involved in this. Um, and this is, you know, this is your vision that you are, you know, imposing on people. And it's that something that I would probably be quite uncomfortable with. And what I consider, you know, that, that I'm doing is encouraging people to uh, be more um, experimental in themselves. But so I'm kind of interested in how you do you perceive of the, the artwork as being the thing that people are kind of fitting themselves into. Yeah, I guess, um, I know what you mean, but I think for me, uh, there is what I, th I think is important is giving people quite a lot of choice in experiences. And I know it might seem uh, different projects of mine have different levels of control. Okay. <laughs> so if you're going into one in one out, I mean, that's what you're doing. You're going into one in one out. There's, you can do whatever you like inside. You're kind of left on your own. Um, but I think so in the new national parks project, if someone just wants to walk their dog around our national park, fine by me. If someone wants to sit there with their kids for three hours at the picnic bench and going and taking a picture of all the little, the trail of things that we've hidden around, fine by me. Um, but I think how, I think the way that it works is, I think it goes back to playing with these, what our behavioral codes are and about something about, you know, a security guard dressed in a uniform, a ranger dressed in a uniform, border patrol guard dressed in a uniform, like 
there's something in us which tells us how to behave around these people and I actually think it's really fun when you kind of you can subvert that slightly so we're not very it's hard to tell from the pictures I guess we're not very author, author, authoritarian with people at all um, and I think something that was really nice so with one in one out when we're dressed as bouncers like there's kind of this thing which always happens if you're queer but maybe not visibly queer you go to a queer space and the bouncer said oh excuse me love you do know this is a gay bar and being able to kind of say like have those those jokes with people where we recognize the kind of that this is a shared experience that we've had of being like oh for god's sake um it kind of you're kind of poking fun at those authorities as well and I guess I would say these three works are not the summation of my practice and I also share your ambition that participatory work can in some forms help people to to play much more freely than the works that I've discussed so I guess I have some other works which are more indoors, um, which which literally it's it is kind of all about very much about the participate the participants' journey. So what, in answer to your question about what I see as the artwork, I see it as the experience that people are having, like the fact that I've um, I don't know designed a map or built um, a thing or designed a uniform. Like I don't I don't see those artifacts as the work I see the kind of the experience as the work because also people <laughs> would look at the artifacts and be like this is just some like basic graphic design <laughs> happening here um so yes that that's my answer I think how did you organize it with the border who did you have to talk to to put the border on the street did you have to talk to the council or did you just do it as a flat thing. Um, so because for that one, we were part of a festival, we, uh, yeah, we just, we didn't actually agree the sites with the producers. They were happy for us to just pop up anywhere um, to their annoyance sometimes. <laughs> and actually to the very, uh, the high annoyance of the techies working on the, at the festival who pass the border quite a few times a day <laughs> um but we were very firm and made them get their passport stamped but it, it's not like a long process but i think it, it was necessary in for that work to kind of be that strict about it um did that work come about after brexit was it was that anywhere in the kind of compilation of that work or What's really sad is that as a pre-Brexit piece, <laughs> um, and when we were on our way to do it, we said, oh, if if there's a referendum, like we're definitely gonna go out and campaign, or, you know, on the Remain side. Um, but it was a, a part of a festival which was looking specifically at um, migration and borders and it was, the kind of it was a, it was at the time of the kind of emergence of the sort of Syrian refugee crisis so all of the the works in there were dealing with this issue in various ways we issued them with a passport and then you could collect the stamps so like it was a different if you pass through the border at the toilet you got the toilet stamp if you pass through it outside the restaurant, you've got the burger stamp. So there then became this kind of, oh, I've got to collect all the stamps <laughs> thing as well, which was quite nice. I've got a question, Lindsay. Yes. Which is around your relationship to uh, commissioning opportunities. Mm. Do you ever see a, an opportunity and design something in response to that way? Uh, do you often start creating the work that you want and then kind of look for the opportunity to fund and resource it or a combination of both? I guess, what's your starting point often? Yes, it 
it is a combination of both um and how like in terms of actually getting money and getting support it's a combination of approaches so have i uh, i'm just trying to think of a project which was uh new national parks was made in response to a brief so the festival in germany basically they had six sites and they said we want to make uh, in a particular kind of um a neighborhood which didn't have kind of a lot going on so they had these six sites and one of them was the, this massive wasteland um and we developed the work in response to that brief um and then since kind of adapted it and have taken it to other places but i think there's i guess particularly with site-specific work there's a value to both because it it really it worked really well in that space because it was designed completely with that space in mind um i've also definitely been guilty of seeing open calls and thinking ah i've got this one project which if i just like twist the way that <laughs> twist the way that i talk about it a bit maybe it will be appropriate um and why not that's always worth punt um <laughs> but i've also found it's quite good to have like a various like a big scale of work so at one end i have a um, project called home sweet home which is actually quite a high cost project it needs to happen indoors really it involves a lot of people a lot of time and so that really works on kind of a commission people kind of approaching us with commissions i also have a project called citizens exchange bureau which is just two of us and a packet of post-it notes and a pen so so knowing when you see like if you see an opportunity where like a small festival can pay you a hundred pound or 200 pound to do something you know you're not gonna devalue your time i guess by always always wanting to give more and i think there's there's knowing that okay this project i'd love to do it there but i can't do it for a hundred pounds it's just not it's too much so yeah having a range of projects i always look at open calls and if 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 something develops specifically in response to something go with it but most of the work has started as something and then i've kind of sought support for it thanks Lee. that's really helpful and um, i think we've got time for uh, one more question Oh. Got a question that you'd like to ask us, Lucy? Yeah, what is the what have you, what have you been doing? <laughs> What's the track on the floor? Is it some weird sports day? <laughs> <laughs> no.
And uh, are all of you going to be presenting something on the trail as part of the trail? Okay. And when is that? <laughs> okay. I am in East Dulwich. <laughs> No, that sounds fun. Yeah, of course. <laughs> what part of the world? I was we hoping for some really exotic answer. I was like, no, South London. <laughs> but also how you talk about it and we've been we've been kind of exploring that this morning about kind of how do we actually articulate our participatory practice and the kind of specifics and nuance of like our approach as individuals rather than the idea of there being a participatory practice yeah it's been really brilliant to hear how you do that with such finesse thank you <laughs> thank you, thank you. Thank you.